And if you have your Bibles, we're coming from the book of 1 Peter. If you have your Bibles, we're coming from the book of 1 Peter. If you could, rise to your feet in respect and honor of God's word. We're coming from 1 Peter, the second chapter, starting at the 19th verse. Peter, the apostle, Peter, the one who took out a knife and cut off the ear of a servant, Peter, who denied our Savior three times, Peter, who was told by Jesus, get ye behind me, after he said such bold things as, Lord, you are the Son of God. But Peter, one thing that Peter does so well is he makes mistakes and he asks for forgiveness. And Peter is a reflection of who we are as people in a microcosmic way, meaning that we sometimes act like Peter ourselves. If you have it, say amen. If not, you need more time. Anybody need more time? Very good. And it reads as follows. For this is a thankworthy if a man for conscience towards God endure grief, suffering wrongfully, for what glory is it if when ye is buffeted for your faults, ye shall take it patiently? But if ye, when ye do well, suffer for it, take it patiently, this is acceptable with God. For even unto, hereunto ye were called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that ye should follow his steps. Who did not, who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth. Who, when he was reviled, reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself that to him that judges right, righteously, who his own self bear our sins in his own body on a tree, that we being dead to sins should live unto righteousness, by whose stripes ye were healed. Verse 25. For ye were as sheep going astray, but now, but are now returned unto the shepherd and bishop of your souls. Please be seated and pray, pray with me now. Father, we just thank you right now, Lord. We thank you for everything you're doing in our lives, Lord. We thank you for this day, the sunshine. We thank you for the early morning fog, Lord, that cleared away to reveal your glorious light. Now, Father God, let the congregation see you and hear you. Reduce me, make me small. Let them hear and only hear and see you. Focus upon your word, Lord, today. Father God, strengthen those who right now are weak, those who are suffering, those who need you, Lord. Let them know that they can come to you with whatever is on their mind and in their heart. Lord, let them know that you are the great healer. You are the great redeemer. You are the great problem solver. Father God, whatever they need right now, Lord, be that thing that they need. Father God, let them trust in you. Let the people adore you. Let the people hear you and worship you. Father God, at the end of the service, I give thanks now for the advancement of your kingdom, for the one, the two, the whosoever that decides to give their life to your son, Jesus, for salvation. Father God, it is in the mighty name of Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Giving honor to God to the saints seated here before me, I would like to lift up verse 21 where it says, for even here unto ye were called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that ye should follow his steps. Because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that ye should follow his steps. Leaving us an example that ye should follow. I'd like to speak from the thoughts this morning. Follow the leader. Follow the leader. Turn to your neighbor and say, neighbor, oh my neighbor, I'm not lost. I'm just taking a shortcut. Leadership, to God be the glory, leadership is a hard thing to teach people. There are some people, the French call it a certain je ne sais quoi. There are certain people who are born with, that are born natural leaders. And others, others have to be molded and shaped into a leader. When I was in the Marines, one of the things I've learned that by the time you make the rank of corporal, that would be E4, it would force you to be a leader whether you wanted to be or not. 
Meaning the rank itself brought certain expectations that had to be met. And if you hadn't any leadership skills in you or if your superiors were not preparing you to be in a leadership role, it was revealed and evidenced in your lackluster performance. And that's why every good leader prepares the people under their authority for the moment in time when they have to step up and become a leader. That statement is not only true in the military, but also for the corporate and civilian workforce as well. People write many books about leadership and people pay big money for seminars to go to to study and how to become good leaders. But there's one thing for sure. There are two types of leaders, a good one, and a bad one. The good ones, you can tell right off the bat because they are taking care of the people under their charge. You see, good leaders make decisive decisions for the safety and welfare of the people under their authority. They take responsibility for their mistakes and hold themselves accountable and act swiftly to correct the errors that they make. Also, always, they are making sure that the people under their authority are well-trained, ready for work, cared for, feel safe. This creates, a, creates loyalty between the worker and the boss and also a sense of esprit de corps. And then there's the bad leader. They can't find their way out of a wet paper bag. They blame everyone else for their mistakes. The people under their charge feel oppressed, harassed, attacked, and lacking, and always feeling unsafe. I was told by a sergeant major, that's the highest enlisted rank in the unit, that the rule of leadership, the very first rule of leadership, is to set the example for your Marines to follow. The leader takes all the hits and hardships. He suffers on behalf of his people. He takes the dangerous position and seeks the safest position for those under his authority. He takes the uncomfortable position and makes sure the people he works with has the comfortable position. And that's why we get paid the big bucks, Marine. That's what the Sergeant Major told me. And then he went on and said to us, you lead by doing it with them. You're the first one in and the last one out. You make sure everyone is fed, bed, and well led. That is your job, Marine. Meaning, they've all got to have the things they need to be successful. And if I didn't know better, that Sergeant Major was talking about my Jesus. You see, Jesus set the example for us to follow. He took the hits. He took the hardship of the cross. He suffered on behalf of his people. He took the danger position on the cross for our salvation. Seeking our salvation. Seeking the safety of our souls first. He became sin so that we can have the righteousness of God. That's being uncomfortable. Making sure that we were comfortable and not going to hell. You see, Jesus got paid the big bucks, enduring the shame of the cross, only to sit at the right hand of God the Father. That's what we see here in today's text. Peter is writing to a group of people that have been devastated by oppression. Saying in chapter 1, verse 1, to the pilgrims of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. These people were dispersed because of attacks and oppression for being a Christian. They were persecuted for their faith in Jesus Christ. Peter had to step up in his leadership role as an apostle is writing to these believers to encourage them to remain faithful and trust in Jesus for deliverance and to meet every one of their needs. Teresa, Peter provides leadership and a steady hand through the writing of his letter to comfort, to strengthen, and to aid those believers feeling scared, lonely, and unloved. Now, Peter does this in a way that, that we are quite familiar with. In chapter 2, verse 9 of the same, the same book, he says, who are, he explains in detail who we are in Jesus, saying, you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of the darkness and into his marvelous light. The him that Peter is referring to, say a sweet name with me, somebody say Jesus. Jesus is our perfect example of leadership to follow. 
Now, in today's text, we will see Peter explain why we should follow the perfect leader, Jesus. So come closer with me now as we look at the text, starting at verses 19 and 20. For this is a thankworthy thing. If a man for conscience towards God endure grief, suffering, and wrongfully, for what glory is it if we, when we become buffeted for your faults, ye shall take it patiently. But if when ye do well and suffer for it, ye take it patiently, this is acceptable with God. This is where I'd like to give you three for the Trinity, for the glory of God. My first point, following a leader will cause you to become a suffering saint. Following the leader will cause you to become a suffering saint. We see the suffering saints. Let's dissect this text together, line by line this morning, shall we? The saint, the man or woman, will suffer because they are a Christian. Persecution and attacks will come your way, brothers and sisters. We wear a target on our back, Sharon, that stands for Jesus. The devil has marked us for harassment. The devil has marked us and targeted us so that his minions can come and assault us. But that's just part for the course, my brothers and sisters. Peter tells us in chapter 4 of the same book we're in, do not think it strange concerning the fiery trials, which is to try you as though some strange things that happen to you. In other words, expect it. It's coming. Expect it because of whose you are. That's who you belong to, Jesus. Expect those attacks because of what you are. You are a Christian. The text says in verse 19, for this is thankworthy. And for man, for conscience towards God, endures grief, suffering wrongfully. You're going to be attacked. The word conscience, Jan, is referring to how you think and where your mind is at. Your mind is in Christ Jesus. You belong to God. Now, words like thankworthy and endure, endure we don't like because it means we should be thankful for the attacks. Wait a minute. I got to be thankful for being attacked? Yes. Wait a minute. Should I endure persecution and be thankful for it? Yes. We are thankful for all things. All things. Look at verse 20. For what glory is it if when we are buffeted? Buffeted means attacked, assaulted. For your faults. Our faults that we have is our belief in Jesus Christ. Ye shall take it patiently. There's a question mark there. It's what we call a rhetorical question. Meaning we already know the answer before it's given. But if when ye do well and suffer for it, ye take it patiently. This is acceptable with God. Translation, deal with it. For it is for the glory of God. For what glory is it when you are attacked for your faults and for your faith that you take it patiently? But when you do suffer, take it patiently and endure. God gives you the strength to make it through every attack and situation. This is acceptable with God. Now, everything we do is for the glory of God. Even your sufferings for your faith. Things posted on Facebook about you is for the glory of God. Things tweeted about you is for the glory of God. Being attacked, being harassed, being pressured, being bullied, talked about in the break room, laughed at. These are all for the glory of God. Whatever form the attacks that it takes, you are enduring it for Christ. We Christians hate long suffering. The word long just bothers us so much. It means lengthy, extensive, protracted, drawn out. But if Jesus, but if Jesus could hang from the sixth and ninth hour on the cross to save your soul from a burning hell, why can't you endure a little persecution that comes your way? Why? 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 Jesus told Paul in 2 Corinthians 12 and 9, My grace is sufficient for you. My strength is made perfect in weakness. And because of that, Paul would go on and brag. He said, I will boldly boast in infirmities and persecution that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Paul would say that he could do all things through Christ that strengthened me. Paul would say, I'm more than a conqueror through Christ Jesus. Paul would say... We can praise him when attacks come our way. We need to trust in God for his peace that passes all understanding. 
We need to rejoice sometimes. We need to rejoice to the extent that you partake also in the sufferings of Christ. That when his glory is revealed, you may be glad with exceeding joy. We need to rejoice if anyone suffers as a Christian. That's me, that's you, that's anyone that's present today. Let them not be ashamed, but give them glory in God in his manner. Peter tells us that we have the perfect example to follow, and his name is Jesus. Look at the text, verses 21 through 24. For even hereunto were ye called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that ye should follow his steps. Who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth. Who, when he was reviled, reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself to the ju him that judges righteously. Verse 24. Who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree, that we, being dead to sins, should live unto righteousness, by whose stripes he were healed. We see our second point. We see the Savior's standards of perfection for leaders to follow. We see the Savior's standards of our perfection for leaders to follow. When it comes to being a perfect leader, we have Jesus for the perfect example. Peter is directly quoting or paraphrasing the prophet Isaiah from the 53rd chapter of Isaiah. But this is what we must remember about Peter. Don't forget about Peter. Peter did four things that we still do today. First, he walked and spent time with Jesus, listened to his teachings firsthand. Second, he denied Jesus, sinning directly against our Lord. Third, he witnessed for Jesus as an apostle preaching the gospel. And lastly, he suffered persecution and death all for the cause of Christ. But maybe, maybe I'm wrong. Hmm, let's think about this for a moment. We can spend time with Jesus in his word, can't we? We deny Jesus sometimes in our lifestyle, in our walk, in our talk, and the way we do things. We too are like Peter who denied Jesus. We deny him when we sin against him. We suffer persecution, but we are quickly to deny our affiliation, our connection, our bond, our love for the Lord when attacks come our way. In other words, when people call you a Christian, you shy away, you run away from that title because there's a sense of shame of it or you're afraid of the attacks. Jesus said if we deny him, he'll deny us. So we can too be like Peter. Yes, some of us are all a Peter in all the good ways and in all the bad ways as well. But the one thing we can do like Peter is this. When we sin against God, we too can repent from our sins. Not repeat, but repent from our sins. 1 John 1 9 says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's the kind of God I serve. My Jesus, who will forgive my sins, even when I sin against him by denying him, he'll forgive me. I thank you, Jesus, for that. But let's take apart these four verses real quick. Starting at verse 21. We have a calling, y'all, and it is to follow Christ's perfect example. He suffered for us on the cross, and the requirement is to follow in his steps. That's verse 21. Luke tells us in the ninth chapter, Jesus said, if any man will follow, will come after me, they let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. That's our requirement, to follow Christ. Jesus didn't sin. Verse 22. Jesus didn't sin. The word guile means to lie, cheat, and to deceive. And Jesus did none of that. Verse 23, when he was reviled, hated, loathed, despised, he didn't return hate for hate, but instead he gave love. When they beat an innocent man, whipped him, shamed him, he suffered, but he did not look back to hurt them. He took the pain. His blood covered a multitude of sins. He saved us by his love. Jesus could have called down legions of angels, but he didn't threaten not. Jesus did one thing that we have trouble doing. Look at verse 23. He trusted in God. Verse 23 says the following. Look where it says, but committed himself to him that judges righteously. 
He trusted in God the Father. At a time when everything evil was happening to him, the abuse, the torture, the pain, the suffering, it was at his worst moments he trusted in God. The question I have for you today, brothers and sisters, is this. Can you, will you follow the example of Jesus when he was threatened? He didn't say a curse. He didn't cuss back, but we might want to cuss back at somebody. I always say a good Christian has at least four or five cuss words in their pocket ready to throw at somebody who crosses them in traffic when they throw up that middle finger at them when they're driving. Jesus, when insulted, he didn't reply. Jesus, when his reputation was destroyed, he didn't try to defend himself, but trusting in God to do it. Jesus, when our health was bad, when the pain is running up and down your body making you cry out, do you trust him to heal you? When you're down and out to your last dime, you got more month than money, will you trust God to provide for you? Look at the text again. Jesus committed himself to him that judged righteously. That's our God. I don't know what you're going through today, but Jesus provides for us the perfect example for us to trust in God when the moment, when the time, when the situation that we are in are at its ugliest. Is at its worst. Anybody experiencing ugly moments right now in their lives? Anybody? 2020 has been a very ugly year for some people. There has been some great loss. People lost businesses, loved ones. They've lost their homes. They lost their jobs. They lost their mind. They lost their health. But we're not alone. Jesus is with us every step of the way. Let me say that at the beginning. Because the devil will have you believing that you are alone, but Jesus is with you every step of the way. If you don't believe me, look at the verse. The scripture says in 21, follow his steps. Will you trust Jesus today and walk with him? But look at the text, verse 24. This has got to be the hardest part for me in the text. Look carefully what Jesus did for us, what he did for you and for me. Verse 24. Who of his own self bear our sins in his own body on a tree? That we being dead to sin should live unto righteousness. By whose stripes ye are healed. Now, what he means when he says we must be dead to sin, that's our job. We must walk away from sin, stay away from sin, run from it, flee from sin, and not to do the things that ruin and corrupt our walk with Christ. We must crucify ourselves daily. Jesus took our sins to the cross. The Bible says he that hangs on a tree is cursed. He took the curse of sin that we might become the righteousness of God. The beating he took from the Roman soldiers, the scars. But the best part, we are healed by those stripes. We are healed two ways. We are healed both physically and spiritually. We are reconciled with God because of the cross. You see... The cross, it's not called the old, smooth, well-sanded cross, but it was rugged. It was splinter-filled, digging into his back and into his pain. The nails, nails were meant to hold him in place between heaven and earth. The piercing in his side. And please, please don't forget the crown of thorns meant to mock him, to humiliate him, making fun of his status as Jesus, King of the Jews. Jesus, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Jesus, my way maker. Jesus, my friend. Jesus, my hope. Jesus, your hope. Jesus, my peace. Jesus, my joy. My heavy load sharer. My heavy load bearer. The lover of my soul. He's our Savior. Jesus provides the standard for us, y'all. Minerva, we are to follow him. This is a faithful saying, Ed. For if he died, we die with him. We shall also live with him. If we endure, we shall reign with him. If we deny him, he will also deny us. If we are faithless, he remains faithful. He cannot deny himself. He can't deny us because we belong to him. Anybody want to put their trust in Jesus today? Anybody want to praise God for all that he's doing in your life? Come on and give him a hand clap of praise. These are some hard standards, but they're the standards that God has laid out for us. You see, we can do all things through Christ to strengthen us. That's what we say, but do we believe that? Let's look at our points in review. Our first point, 
following a leader will cause you to become a suffering saint or the saints that are suffering. Second point, we see the, stand, the, survive, the Savior's standards of perfection for leaders to follow. My third and final point, when following a leader, when following a leader, you must remember you are sheep and, sh and Jesus is the shepherd. You are sheep and Jesus is shepherd. Turn to your neighbor and just go back. We are nothing but sheep. Look at text, verse 25. For if we, if ye were as sheep going astray, but are now returned unto the shepherd and bishop of your souls. I just have to ask the question this morning. What type of sheep are you? What type of sheep are you? Are you the one that stays in the sheep pen? Or are you the one that wanders out? Are you the one that stays with the 99? Or does the Lord have to keep going out after you? Are you the type of sheep that when strangers come in, telling you false doctrine, telling you lies, luring you with sweet, tasty lies that tickle your fancy and meet all the things you like to hear? Or are you easily distracted by the things of this world, the money, the sex, the drugs? You become quick to follow and are led astray. What type of sheep are you? Look at the last se first seven. Look at the first seven words. For ye were as sheep going astray. At some point in time, we were those lost sheep. Everyone here. The Bible says Romans three ten. There is none righteous, no not one. Romans three twenty three says all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Romans six twenty three says for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. But hold it right there. There's a payment, a wage, a result. There's an accountability piece with this thing. Something is due when we sin, brothers and sisters. Y'all remember the old song, Jesus paid it all. Yes, he paid it all. Yes, he did. He became the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world, paying the sin debt that we owe. Jesus' blood covers a multitude of sins. For when we were still without strength, in due time, Christ Jesus died for the ungodly. But God demonstrates his own love towards us, that in while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. For if we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son. Much more, having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. No one else would do that for you, my brothers and sisters. No one. I wouldn't do it. You wouldn't do it for me. The only person that would do it for us, say his sweet name with me. Somebody say Jesus. Jesus is the only one who would do that for you and me. Look at the verse 25 in its entirety again. For ye were as sheep going astray, but are now returned unto the shepherd and bishop of your souls. Look at the words were and return. Both for in the past tense, meaning this is, thank God, what we used to be. Amen. Somebody shout on that. We weren't those things anymore once we come to Jesus. We may struggle with some things, but we ain't those old titles we used to be. You're no longer that drunk, dopey, drug addict. You're no longer that loose, lascivious, lying person. You're no longer that thug, thief, terrorizing tyrant. You are a new creature in Christ. The word return, the word return, we once were lost but now are found we used to be but if anyone is in Christ he or she is a new creature all things have passed away and behold all things have become new now the word shepherd defines itself it's the one who watches over a flock of animals specifically in this case sheep we are the sheep but the word bishop is a little more detailed and with more added responsibility. It comes from two Greek words combined. Epi, meaning above, and skapos, meaning looking. Combine the two, you get skapos, or overseer, translating into English, bishop. When you think of what Jesus does for us, is above all... And he's always looking and overseeing, looking out for us. Let me tell you what the perfect shepherd and bishop of your souls will do for you. This is a great benefit program. We have redemption through his blood for the forgiveness of our sins. By him, we are reconciled all things to himself, having made peace through the blood of, 
of his blood through the cross. You who were once alienated, you who were once enemies in your mind, you who were once wicked in your works and your thoughts are now reconciled, bonded back to Jesus in the body of his flesh through his death. We are now presented holy, blameless, and above reproach in his sight. That means we're perfected and sanctified. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, For he made him who knew no sin to become sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. That's what the good shepherd does. Now, Randy, when I was a Marine, I had a friend named Max. Max was a great guy. Let me tell you this. He was an armored vehicle mechanic. He could fix anything. And Margie, you know for a fact your pastor has only one tool in his toolbox. That's a hammer. Well, one day, I bought a computer table that was very difficult to put together. I contacted Max, and he came over, and we put that thing together. He brought his toolbox over and his drill and began working. Now, I asked Max, don't we need to follow the directions? Max replied, I put things together like this all the time. Zip, zip, boom, boom, before you know it, the computer table was done. But we had a few pieces left on the side. I asked Max, I said, Max... I don't, I, 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 what's, what's all that over there? And he says, I don't know. He said, aren't those important? They're not important. So we stepped back. We both looked at the work we'd done, proud of ourselves, full of pride, beaming, until the table began to lean to the left and fall over. The pieces we forgot were the centerpiece, the center bar. It makes a perfect cross keeping the top and bottom stabilized the whole table, preventing it from falling over. A very important piece. I'll say it again. They were the center bar. It makes a perfect cross keeping the top and bottom stabilized, preventing it from falling over. If we had only read the directions, the table wouldn't have fell apart and fell over. But that's how it is with sheep. We don't want to read directions. You see, sheep don't get smarter. Saints do. How do we get smarter? I'm glad you asked that question, Ms. Anita. We get smarter by reading God's direction, God's Bible that he's provided for us in his word. We didn't follow the directions and the table fell apart. You didn't follow God's directions in the Bible and now your life is falling apart. Now you're begging God to help you put it back together again. But if you just follow the cross, if you just follow Jesus, if you just believe that he can take care of it, he will stabilize your situation. If you keep Jesus at the center of everything you do, the center of your joy, the center of your life, the center of your hope, the center of your peace, everything you need. If we could only follow the leader, saints wouldn't suffer so much. If we trust in the Lord, you can hit that picture now. If we trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. I got that from my dear friend Deb. She showed me that. Every time we try to lean on our own understanding, that's what our life looks like. We cry out to the Lord. He'll hear us and save us from all our trouble. If we cry out to the Lord, he'll deliver us from all our fears. If we will only follow the Savior's steps and keep his standards, keep his standards, flee from sin, run to his righteousness, trust in God for his protection, his peace, and his joy. If we could only follow the Savior's direction and not go astray and let him lead us, Brandy, the shepherd will oversee us. Let him be the bishop of our souls. Lastly, Last time, yeah, the perfect leader to follow. Go ahead and hit that last slide. It's Psalms 23. Go, uh, go back one more. Psalms 23 gives us the example of a perfect leader. Verse 20, Psalms 23 says in the first verse, the Lord is my shepherd. He's the one that takes care of us. The part that says, I shall not want. Look what he does. He makes us lie down. That means he's looking out for your best interests. He puts you in green pastures. He puts you beside still waters. He gives you the things you need to be provided for. 
When you are worn out and need rest, he restores your soul. But because he's a perfect leader, look what he does. He leads you in paths of righteousness. He doesn't take you down paths that are unsafe for you. He doesn't lead you to places where it can wreck your life. We do that for ourselves when we go astray. Verse 4, we walk through valleys of the shadow of death. But the thing is this, when we're walking and living this life, look what he does. He's with me. I'm not alone. You are not alone. We don't go through this alone. His rod and his staff, they are there to comfort you. He prepares a table for you. He anoints you. He sanctifies you. But we sang a song earlier. Goodness and mercy. God is a stalker of you. Look what he does. He follows me all the days of my life. We're never alone. I dwell in the house of the Lord forever. This is who we have. This is who we follow. We must follow the perfect leader. We must follow the perfect leader. We don't go looking at the other things. We can't be sheep that go astray. We must focus on the Savior. We're coming in the season when everyone, they always say the suicides go up and people get more depressed because they find themselves lonely. But we forget who comforts us, who provides for us. If you look at the 23rd Psalm, just when you get scared, when you get lonely, look at the whole Bible if you can. But if you can remember one thing and you can't for, and you can't and you forget everything else, go to the 23rd Psalm. That's the perfect leader. That's the one who's there for you. That's the one that takes care of us. We can't be scared. We can't be alone because our God says he loves us. He will never leave us nor forsake us. So for that person who's been thinking all day long, why am I here? Why did I wake up this morning? It's because God loves you. It's because God loves you. We just sang this song, Jesus, he loves you. He loves me. He loves me. There's no lie in that. He went to the cross for you. That's what he does. That's what he did. That's who we are. We're Jesus's. If you would rise to your feet, there may be someone who don't know Jesus for the salvation of their sins, for the salvation of their soul, for the forgiveness of their sins. It's no military secret. If you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. It's in the name of Jesus that man and woman, a boy, a girl, it's by the name of Jesus that you will be saved. His name has power. His name has love. His name has peace. It gives all those things. But you must commit to it. The Spirit is all you need to do is to, do is to confess it. Burning like is to believe in it. Confess, believe, and trust. You'll be saved on one day. If you're looking for a church home, this is the place to be. See the grove. God has ordained it for this time for you to be here. For this moment for you to be here. To praise and worship His Son Jesus. Will there be one today? Will there be one?